Ladies and gentlemen, uh, judges, colleagues, friends, uh, most people fit into all those categories. Uh, I'm Sarah Worthington, with an odd voice this evening, I'm sorry, but I'm Sarah Worthington, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the faculty uh, to the 2017 Cambridge Allen and Overy Lecture. This lecture is the sixth in a series that Allen and Overy has sponsored uh, since 2012. And I think it's a, a tribute to them that right from the outset they were prepared to, um, under, to support this venture of having a public lecture in the area of private law uh, where we would have an opportunity to debate, discuss, challenge um, some of the really difficult issues in private law. And I think that uh, tonight will undoubtedly continue that lively tradition. We've got Simon Deacon's title for his lecture, The Evolution of Vicarious Liability. In a sense, uh, this lecture couldn't be better timed, could it? Uh, I think I had always thought that vicarious liability was rather old hat. I'd studied it as an undergraduate, but um, not really given it much thought since then. And in the last 18 months, we've had two Supreme Court decisions, one just three weeks ago, I think. So uh, I suppose Simon Deacon tonight will not only lay out the evolutionary path of this uh, form of liability, but also the ideas that underpin it and try and persuade us perhaps of uh, what will lie ahead or what ought to lie ahead uh, in this area. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Simon Deacon uh, probably needs no introduction to most of you. He's a professor of law here in Cambridge, and he is the first homegrown uh, speaker in this Allen and Overy series, so uh, a special thank you for that. Uh, he has expertise that ranges across a vast legal terrain, probably more than other of my law colleagues. So uh, his expertise, labour law, tort law, contract law, company law, EU law, and not only that, but within each of those areas, he usually uh, does not study them within a narrow legal context, but deploys arguments and analysis used by scholars in law and economics or law and development or empirical legal studies. So he's a rather special sort of private lawyer. I guess put generally, his research is um, looking at the relationship between law and the social sciences, but how it fits within the social science field. He doesn't just do research, he's the director of the Multidisciplinary Centre for Business Research, and he is co-chair of the university's strategic research initiative in public policy. He's a fellow of Peterhouse, uh, he's worked at Queen Mary College in London, and at the University of Chicago, I thought the contrast was quite nice, uh, before returning uh, to Cambridge Law Faculty where he had been a student. He's held visiting appointments. You can imagine he's the sort of person who would be attractive to overseas institutions. And uh, he's held those appointments in France, Australia, the US, Italy, Japan. I could probably keep on going. And his books uh, include books on tort law, labor law, hedge fund activism, and again, I could keep on going. He was elected a Fellow of the British Academy in 2005, and I think if you put all of that together, uh, probably what I'm trying to say is that I think we're in for a treat. Uh, he will, Simon will talk for 45 or 50 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions, and then we can have drinks afterwards. But without more ado, I hand over to Simon. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thank you uh, all for coming, and thanks to Alan and Overy for supporting the, the lecture this evening. So, the evolution of vicarious liability, um, clearly a hot topic, but we didn't imagine it would be quite so topical, because we set the theme for this lecture quite a long time ago. Then, um, within the last month, the Supreme Court decided the arms case. And so, they decided in this case that the principle of vicarious liability can extend to cover a situation in which a foster child is abused by her parents, the foster child has been placed with the parents by the local authority, can the local authority be liable for the torts committed by the parents? The answer is yes, 
according to the Supreme Court in the arms case, and liability is vicarious. Now, normally, uh, vicarious liability is different from that. It's a liability of an employer for a tort committed by an employee in the course of their employment. Clearly, the, the foster parents were not normally in the position of being employees. They weren't, in fact, employees of the council, and there are issues here about whether an intentional tort could ever be within the scope of employment. So we've jumped a long way from the vicarious liability, which I learned about when I was a student in the early 1980s, to the arms case today. But of course the arms case wasn't completely unexpected and tort law has been developing very rapidly in this area since about 2001 when the House of Laws decided Lister and Hesley Hall. So vicarious liability is one of those ideas within the law that has been evolving extremely quickly. But in, in many ways this is, is nothing new. So its evolution is very long term, as I hope to show. But before I talk about that, I, I want to define some terms. So what do I mean by evolution? Simply the adjustment of a system to an environment, and so in particular the adjustment of the legal system to the environment around it, which includes the market economy, uh, the industrial society we live in, and also the politics of that society. How has tort law evolved over time as the economy has changed from a medieval one to a modern industrial or even a post-industrial one? But of course, uh, law also affects society, so there's co-evolution going on. Evolution can cut both ways. So I prefer to speak about co-evolution, the mutual adjustment of a system and its context. Vicarious liability, what's that? A principle for assigning legal liabilities to organisations. So I wish to explore the idea that vicarious liability is a form of enterprise or organisational liability. A system in evolutionary theory is a complex self-organising structure which embeds knowledge. The legal system contains knowledge embedded within it. So an idea like vicarious liability has embedded in it knowledge and information, and in particular information about legal precedents. A system is adaptive, it co-evolves with its environment. We learn this from legal sociology, Nicholas Luhmann's theory of society. And so my theme tonight is not just about vicarious liability, it's about how tort law has co-evolved in this evolutionary way. Tort law, what's that? When I was a student, the first case I ever read was a case about a sword fight that didn't happen in the 17th century. And there's a feeling sometimes that tort law hasn't quite brought itself up to date to an industrial age, let alone the post-industrial one we might be entering. So it would be useful to think about tort law and industrialization almost before it's too late. But this isn't a new theme. So over 100 years ago, Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, the great US Supreme Court Justice, giving a lecture at Harvard Law School, The Path of the Law, said, it appears that tort law is about ungeneralized wrongs, assaults, slanders, and the like. But actually, the courts are busy with other things. They're busy with cases about the business enterprise. And critically, they are about the principle we're going to discuss this evening, the principle of enterprise liability. Injuries to persons using uh, the railroad, injuries caused by products made in factories, injuries to people in the factories... The liability for these is estimated and sooner or later goes into the price paid by the public. So the enterprise internalises these costs and largely passes them on through pricing and insurance. So the real question for tort law has always been, and is now, how far the public should pay for the harm suffered by those who are the victims of accidents. This is not a completely new theme. And to address it, I think we need to look a little bit beyond um, legal analysis while not forgetting the importance of juridical language. Now Holmes in 1897 said this very provocative thing which is that for the rational study of law the black letter man or woman may be the person of the present but the person of the future is the person of statistics and the master of economics. Now that prediction hasn't completely come true but in the meantime our attention has turned to other disciplines not just economics I think but also political science and sociology. In 1997, Nicholas Luhmann, who began his career as a lawyer, he trained as a lawyer, but then became a sociologist, and perhaps the most important sociologist of the 20th century, said in 1997, on my appointment to the Department of Sociology established at the University of Bielefeld, I was asked what research projects I had running. My project wasn't ever since has been the theory of society. Term, 30 years, cost none. Right, OK. So Luhmann said, you don't actually have to spend all your time doing interdisciplinary research outside the academy. 
and not every project requires vast expenditure of time and resources. Of course, I should say to any early career researchers who are present that we shouldn't follow Lumen's advice, especially at a job interview. Right. And it's not altogether clear whether Lumen uttered these words before or after he'd been offered the post he accepted. It may not be a good idea to follow Lumen's exact example, how many of us could um, maintain a 30-year research project costing nothing. But this is a reminder that interdisciplinarity takes many forms, and Lumen, as a lawyer, was very interested in legal language from a sociological perspective. What about the economists? Um, now, we learn from the 1960s and 1970s onwards that tort law and contract law are, in a sense, the internal code of a market economy. They are the deep structure of the rules which govern the market economy and, in some sense, constitute it. They have a close relationship to it. Guido Calabresi in The Costs of Accidents says the function of tort law is to minimise total accident costs. So that includes not just the harms which victims of accidents may suffer, but also the avoidance costs which defendants incur to limit their liabilities and the process costs of organising compensation. It's a total costs, not just the harms to victims which need to be minimised. And we have to accept that at some level a decision to base our tort system on fault is a decision for a certain level of accidents. We tolerate, as a society, a certain level of accidents. We no longer have people walking in front of motor vehicles with a red flag to make sure they don't knock people down. But we did once, we don't anymore. Um, so tort law is about finding the right level of um, governance through law of, of accidents. It's about allocating risks and allocating liability for risks, not preventing accidents completely. Tort law should assign liability risk to the cheapest cost avoider or the least cost avoider, as Richard Posner puts it in Economic Analysis of Law. What does that mean? Impose the cost upon the party who could have minimised the accident most effectively sometimes. That might not always be the enterprise. It might be the employee or the consumer. It could be the enterprise, though, and the enterprise, of course, if it's carrying liability insurance, can diffuse the risk, can price products, can pass the costs on as homes recognise. So often the insurance means that, and the pricing means that the enterprise is the least cost avoider. Liability in tort is based on fault, and liability in contract is strict. I want to come back to this, an important article by William Bishop in 1982. The tort contract boundary is effectively determined, he argued, by the economics of insurance um, and by, by considerations of information. So here's an argument that the whole map of private law, as we understand it, has some kind of implicit under economic underpinning. But if the tort law and contract law systems really are efficient, let's say they minimise the total social costs from accidents, they get liability just right, how do they do that? That's an important question which law and economics has a sort of answer to, and the answer is evolutionary. This is the argument that litigation selects out inefficient rules, and it's not completely novel. Many people in the common law tradition, many judges indeed, have argued that the common law works itself pure. There's a mechanism by which, through litigation and decentralised decision-making, the adoption of precedent, inefficient uh, judgments are purged from the system. This is a law and economics approach that decentralised decision-making by the courts creates an evolutionary context in which the law becomes more efficient over time, and this evolutionary mechanism is lacking in the case of legislation. Now, I want to consider this today, is a common law really efficient? I'll say, maybe, it's qualifiedly efficient, it's not perfect. Do legal rules evolve? Yes, I would like to show how. And here an important idea we find in biology, um, the so-called variation selection retention algorithm I'll explore in a moment. But the idea that this biological model can explain social norms and social structures is what's sometimes called universal Darwinism, and we find this in Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, and Daniel Dennett's Darwin's Dangerous Idea. So biology, to some degree now, enters the story because many of the models biologists use depend upon notions of rational choice and also concepts of structure, which they have in common with economics. Uh, but the biologists give a somewhat more dynamic interpretation to these models. Now, what I'm not saying this evening is that we can use genetics directly to understand the law. There is a body of, of thought which holds we can use genetics to understand social structures, evolutionary psychology and sociobiology. That's interesting, but I don't want to go there today. I rather want to argue that by analogy with biological processes, we can understand social and legal evolution. So society is structured in a way which has some resemblance to laws of evolution that we see in nature, but they're not exactly the same, and we don't completely understand them. But we can look to Dawkins and Darwin and Lumen for inspiration. We can think about DNA and what its equivalents might mean. DNA that was deciphered, of course, just down the road from here. 
in the laboratory um, of molecular biology, and Crick and Watson then went to the Eagle Pub afterwards to celebrate. That's right, but a warning here for all empiricists. We now know they got their basic data from attending a dinner at Peterhouse, in which the uh, crucial data were revealed almost by accident. And Rosalind Franklin, who'd actually done all the empirical work for this, never got the Nobel Prize, which, which they got, although she would have done if she hadn't died. Now, random variation and environmental selection, what exactly is meant by this? Darwin himself in The Origin of Species talks about variation. He says, whenever you have a set, you have a population, and there's variety within that population which can arise through what well, are really just copying errors. We might, we might think of these as copying errors. But there's variety in a species. Some functions... Uh, some features, some design features will work better than others. And where there's scarcity, selection tends to select in the more efficient features. We don't even need to have to understand where the, where the variety comes from. If there's variety in nature, environmental natural selection spontaneously selects in the features which work in the environment. So this happens, as it were, spontaneously without the need for centralised direction. So natural selection is a theory of a spontaneous blind evolution, but not random. The variations can be random, but the patterning of selection is absolutely not random. It can be blind, but not random. It's structured so that the efficient features survive, those which literally fit the environment. And fitness just means that they fit, not that they're necessarily better. That's the Darwinian notion of evolution. And George Priest, in his article about evolution in the Journal of Legal Studies in 1977, applies this idea. He says, in the common law, let's imagine, let's model that judges decide cases completely randomly. Now, I know there are some judges here this evening who might object to the idea that they decide cases randomly. Right, OK. It's just part of the model, so it's just an assumption. But let's assume that we had random decision-making, or let's at least assume some stochastic factor which produces a great deal of variety in the way courts decide cases. That's not so implausible. Take a new development, the 19th century, the steam engine, today, cyberspace. How do courts deal with that? Until there's some clear authority from the appellate court, there could be five or six or seven or eight or even more interpretations of how to deal with this issue. In the middle 20th century, cases on product liability, even in America alone, ran into the thousands just reported cases. So there's a lot of variety while the courts try to work out what the right rule is. Selection works through litigation. So Priest argued that there's a differential litigation effect going on because rules which work, rules which are the right solution, never get litigated against. So these are the rules which never appear before the appellate courts. Litigation is about the rules that people don't like. They have an incentive to challenge them through litigation and arithmetically... Even if judges decided randomly, which we don't think they do, but if they did, then it would be the inefficient rules which don't get challenged. They're the ones that never get before the Supreme Court. It's the rules people don't like which get challenged. And if there were simply random decision-making, they would be culled more frequently than the efficient rules. So over time, a simple arithmetical rule would imply that we're left with the efficient rules. Now, this process, of course, is going on the whole time. It's not a static process. And it may be that judges don't decide randomly. Of course, precedent structures the way courts decide. And this is missing from Priest's approach. He doesn't have a theory of inheritance or retention. The algorithm, supposedly Darwin's dangerous idea, requires variation and selection, but also inheritance. So what that means is that evolution is just as much about continuity as change. Evolution explains why things stay the same and not just why they change. And in nature, genetic forces, DNA, are the mechanism of inheritance. In law, there are similar mechanisms or parallel mechanisms of inheritance. And critically, it is, of course, precedent which helps ensure inheritance or retention of knowledge within the common law. The rule that like cases must be decided alike. The meta-rule of the common law system from which every other rule is derived is a kind of inheritance Principle. Now, you may say this is not nature, these aren't material forces, but what I'm suggesting here is that without that rule, without the rule of precedent, the common law system would begin to fall apart. Imagine if every case were simply decided anew each time, and we never referred back to earlier decisions or to issues of principle. This was recognised by Carl Llewellyn um, in the 1930s, and his book, The Bramble Bush, is supposedly written for first-year law students. Okay, it's possibly the most important book about the common law ever written. And one can only imagine what people thought in their first week of law school at Columbia or Chicago when Llewellyn gave his lectures, which are brilliant, but quite difficult. Um, but Llewellyn's idea was the common law is, of course, a bramble bush. 
um, and it's kind of unwieldy and maybe a bit thorny. Uh, it evolves, it can't be controlled. This is a beautiful bramble bush, isn't it? It's possible to imagine some rather less beautiful ones, but the common law has its own pattern. The bush has its own structure and pattern, but it's evolved spontaneously. Here's Llewellyn in the stacks at Columbia, I think. Um, he was like Lumen. He thought he could do all his research while staying at home. He's doing it in the law library, not out there in the field. No one has a, as exhaustively studied the common law as Carl Llewellyn with his 64 different ways to distinguish a case. Right, this is exhaustive analysis of exactly what the judges do. So Llewellyn's theory is a theory, he didn't quite put it this way himself, the theory of inheritance. Precedent is the mechanism by which the common law is held together. And juridical language is, of course, critical in this regard. Precedent can mean one of two things, Llewellyn said, building a case up or tearing it down. These two different versions of the doctrine of precedent that the court, when it narrows a precedent, can also be creating the scope for a new rule. This is typical of the common law. Every time there's an innovation, it's done by reference to the past. This is a version of the Lampedusa's leopard principle, that in order for things to stay the same, everything has to change. But in the common law, it's the other way round. In order for things to change, they've got to stay the same. Now, this is the way the common law works. Evolution is both continuity and change simultaneously. The adoption of precedent um, achieves this. That was Llewellyn's point. Lumen's point is that concepts matter. Here's something that the American legal realists didn't care about at all. They thought that deductive legal reasoning, using concepts to decide cases of the sort which are developed prior to the realist movement, the so-called Langdellian revolution in American legal thought at the end of the 19th century, Concepts matter. Concepts like contract, concepts like vicarious liability, concepts like fundamental breach, whatever they may be, these determine the outcomes of cases, and judges use these conceptual tools deductively to reach the outcome in a case. The realists thought that was all nonsense, and what really mattered was politics. If there really are 64 ways to distinguish a case, Llewellyn said, how can we really be sure that an outcome of a particular decision is predetermined by precedent. If there's that much scope for discretion on the part of the court, is precedent really deciding the outcome of a case? But of course, there's more to the common law than precedent. There are abstract ideas which aren't rules. Vicarious liability isn't a rule. And this is, in German, Rechtsdogmatik, conceptual reasoning. And Lumen makes this very interesting observation. He says, a concept embeds information. Now, what did he mean by this? I think he meant that a concept like vicarious liability is a shorthand form for all those hundreds of decided cases, thousands of other cases on this issue. So when we, when we think vicarious liability beneath that term are all the decisions, all the past decisions on this question, and we can decode them using this concept. So legal interpretation is a process of coding, recoding, and decoding these abstract ideas, these forms we call concepts. And these are not just imaginary forms. They've been worked out by the courts, by the judges, by lawyers over many decades through a process of argument. So you can't just argue anything in front of a judge. You've got to refer back not just to precedent, but to these abstract ideas. So they do matter at some fundamental level. And we use them as tools, tools of interpretation, as heuristic devices. They have a sociological function, a function of retaining memory within the system without which the system would fall apart. But are these concepts always ideal for present-day circumstances? Here's Holmes again in the common law. And this is, of course, classic Holmes. This is very um, sarcastic in a way, a little bit cynical, but absolutely fascinating. So he says, the customs, beliefs, or needs of a primitive time establish a rule or formula. We're not quite sure when this is. Maybe the 1850s or the 1350s. Holmes isn't clear. And every rule has beneath it some kind of belief or necessity. But over time, people forget what that is. They forget why the rule exists as it exists. And of course, at that point, the lawyers have a problem. So Holmes says, the reason which gave rise to the rule has been forgotten. So ingenious minds have to set themselves a the task of discovering what the reason is. And of course, by ingenious minds, he meant the common lawyers. Right. These ingenious people find a new justification for the rule. And the rule, he says, then enters upon a new life, and he uses evolutionary language, very interesting. The rule adapts itself. That's even self-referential language of the sort Lumen uses. The rule adapts itself to its new reason and enters upon a new career. The old form receives a new content, and in time, even the new form modifies itself to fit the meaning which it has received. So this is 
What happens to concepts or ideas? They begin with one justification. Of course, it is vicarious liability. They begin with one justification. They end up with another. And we often forget that when we read the cases today, a court may cite decisions on vicarious liability from the 17th century up to the 21st, but the old decisions have a completely different context. And the genealogy may not be what it appears. Now, one role of legal scholarship, therefore, is to engage in a kind of genealogical analysis where we uncover the precise evolution of an idea. And we see that it's rarely straightforward. It's rarely linear. It's inevitably not the way it's presented in a judgment today, because the court's job is not to retrace that genealogy, but use the concept now for its new purpose. But when we as scholars look at these ideas in a genealogical fashion, we may learn something. And this something may tell us a lot about the way the common law works, but it also critically tells us about the usefulness or not of these concepts. Now, a related idea is the concept of a spandrel. So you're probably wondering what on earth this is doing in a law lecture. Um, although not if you've heard me talk about this before. OK, so here's an idea from biology. Stephen Jay Gould, the great evolutionary biologist, had a holiday in Venice, a good idea, and went to the Basilica di San Marco. And inside the cathedral or the basilica, he wasn't focusing on his holiday. He was thinking about evolutionary biology, of course, good academic. And he said, look at these beautiful things called spandrels. So the spandrel is this shape in between the arch, um, up there, top right and top left. This is a spandrel where there are these beautiful reclining figures. So the spandrel, um, Gould thought, is that some sort of efficient design feature? Because the space is just right here to portray beautifully these goddesses or whatever they are, muses or something like that. Isn't this space just designed for the artist to fit the sculpture into? Isn't it efficient for its purpose? Of course, the spandrel isn't there to provide a space for the artist. The spandrel is there to keep the building up. So it's a great example of what he calls exaptation. What looks like a useful design feature was originally there for some other purpose and has been opportunistically adapted to its current end. And if you uncover the genealogy of the spandrel, you can understand why it may not be absolutely perfect for its present purpose. And why are spandrels so widespread in the basilica, but also in law. What are these legal spandrels, concepts invented for one purpose and used for another? Because a transaction costs of inventing a new concept every time the law has a new need are very considerable. The least cost option is to use what's at hand rather than always to invent something new. And that is, again, vicarious liability. It's a legal spandrel. So let's then return to the legal theme that we're addressing this evening, vicarious liability. Where does it begin? Holmes would have said, in some primitive time, there's a discussion about vicarious liability. What are its origins? Possibly uh, in Roman law, the liability of the paterfamilias for uh, members of the household. Possibly in medieval common law, the liability of a master for the tort of a servant in some guild setting, some pre-modern industrial setting. It's not really clear. Um, possibly the term vicarious liability wasn't even used until very recently, maybe the 19th century. But there were lots of antecedents for the idea that a master or the paterfamilias or possibly a principal um, engaged in overseas trade can be liable for the act of a servant or agent or member of the household. There were lots of antecedents, but all these antecedents have nothing at all to do with the modern industrial enterprise. They have nothing at all to do with that because that modern industrial enterprise is a feature of the 19th, not even really the 18th, more like the 19th century. The employer is liable for a tort committed by the employee in the course of employment, but the idea only gradually evolved out of these antecedent sources. And of course, in the 19th century, there wasn't vicarious liability in the sense that we know from the modern law. Now, that was because of something called the common employment or fellow servant rule. Under tort law, in the 19th century, the employer was not liable for a tort committed by an employee in the course of their employment at all if that tort injured a fellow worker. Right, the common employment rule. So vicarious liability, as we now know it, didn't exist in the 19th century. And that was apparently an invention from 1837 in a case called Priestley and Fowler. Um, it spread to America. The American courts were watching. And in Farwell and Boston Railroad Company, they adopted the English law reasoning. It then came back over to uh, England and Scotland in Barton's Hill Coal Company and Reed. In that case, the House of Lords accepted the um, common employment principle, 
Um, so here we have the judges saying um, in Barton's Hill, the Scottish judges, by the way, thought this, this, this was just wrong and said it was not part of Scottish law. In the Barton's Hill case, the House of Lords said it was part of Scottish law. If it be part of the law of England, it must be part of the law of Scotland. In this particular case, two coal miners have been killed when the vertical shaft collided with the top of the pit head and the claim was brought on their behalf for personal injury, the claim failed because the negligence was caused by fellow workers. But what was the purpose of the rule? There never was a more useful decision, or one of greater practical and social importance, in the whole history of the law. Hyperbolic language, perhaps. Okay, Chief Baron Pollock, in a case a couple of years after the Barton Hill decision. Why was it so important that employers be relieved of liability for torts? According to Morton Horwitz in the 1970s, in the transformation of American law. This was useful for developing firms. In an early stage of capitalism, the law was subsidizing enterprises by relieving them of these social burdens, a burden of liability. Not just in American law, in German law too, the notion of vicarious liability has no clear place in the BGB, in the German civil code of the, of the 1890s, partly because of fears that uh, small firms will be overburdened by legal liabilities, that's Basil Marcusinus, the German Law of Torts 1986, referring to a German literature on this issue. So clearly vicarious liability was a huge political question in the 19th century. And so we might be thinking here, okay, vicarious liability has evolved in response to industrialization by lifting the burden on firms. And Horwitz says, vicarious liability is an illustration of the pro-capital bias and anti-labor bias of the common law. Now, there may be many reasons behind that, but I don't think it's the whole story. So in Priestley and Fowler, the issue essentially concerns, well, the name gives it away. There's no company involved in this case. Priestley and Fowler are two personal parties. And the critical issue in this case was who knew more about the way that this particular operation, contract of carriage, would be performed? Was it the worker or was it the employer supposedly hiring them? There was no organization here. It was a casual hiring and the court uses what's really economic reasoning, says the worker knew more about this business than the so-called employer did. And the worker's actually in a better position to internalise this risk. They didn't say that, of course, but what they're really saying is the worker knew more than the supposed master in this case. And that's why it's wrong to impose the liability upon the master. He's just a personal um, defendant like the worker is. He has no real assets. And at this time, in the 1830s, that was true of nearly all manufacturing firms in England. There was an industrial revolution, so-called, from the 1750s onwards, but nearly all manufacturing firms weren't companies. So here, company law comes in. And of course, today, nearly every case involving torts in negligence, except those involving road traffic accidents, where individuals have to carry liability insurance, nearly every case is about a company. It's about a non-human person who is a defendant. And if tort law is about physical injury, by definition, the claimant or plaintiff is nearly always a human being. So tort law is quintessentially the law of human beings suing non-human persons, companies and others. And the purpose of this is, of course, to enable the human plaintiff or claimant to bring a claim against the asset pool of the company. And that's what company law does. Company law partitions the assets of the business, separates those of the trading entity from the shareholders and also the workers. This asset partitioning is fundamental to the way companies operate and, of course, provides the basis for tort law too to function because the claim is being channeled through to the asset pool of the company. So legal personality is intersecting here with the physical structure of the enterprise to provide a remedy. But until much later in the 19th century, most manufacturing firms weren't even legal companies. They were quasi-partnerships involving a hybrid form of the partnership and trust. It was very hard to sue an enterprise. Okay, it was different for railway companies and for certain other statutory companies like utilities. But as late as the 1880s and 1890s, many private sector manufacturing firms lacked legal personality. Now, at that point, of course, it's much more difficult to attach tort liabilities to them. But also, they were small. Most manufacturing firms only employed a few hundred people maybe a few thousand at most, into the 1880s. Today's huge corporations with massive assets didn't exist, and nor did liability insurance. So I think the explanation for vicarious liability being underdeveloped in the 19th century isn't that the common law is inherently pro-capital. It is that at this point, the modern enterprise didn't exist. 
Only when it did exist could vicarious liability more effectively develop. Now, how did that happen? Company law is part of the story. Salomon and Salomon, the implications of corporate personality, the shareholder entrepreneur cannot be sued for the debts of the company. This is only the 1890s. And trading assets and other things weren't clearly demarcated from any firms up, up to this point. But from then on, they very clearly were. And there were other things going on. 1880... Parliament and the Employers' Liability Act changes the position with uh, the um, Common Employment Rule by stipulating that it doesn't apply where the negligence is that of a managerial or supervisory employee. That's important. The law is beginning to recognise there is such a thing as management, that firms are organisations which are managed, so a failure of managerial capacity can give rise to liability. In the 1890s, workmen's compensation comes in. That's a statutory remedy, attaching liability without fault to now the employer as enterprise for risk-related wrongs. And in 1837, we see the invention, really, by the House of Lords of the doctrine of the non-delegable duty of care. The employer owes a personal duty not a vicarious liability type obligation, to the injured employee for breach of an obligation to maintain a safe working environment. This is a so-called non-delegable duty. Performance of the duty can be delegated. It has to be if the defendant is a company, because companies can only operate through real human persons. They have to delegate what they do. Delegation of the performance of duty is inevitable, but liability cannot be delegated. The enterprise, the corporate form, is liable for the fault of the individual manager or other employee who commits the wrong. But now with non-delegable duty, there's no need for there to be a tort committed by the employee in question. That's disappeared. The employer's personal duty means the employer is responsible for a managerial default, an organisational failure. And this is enterprise liability. The enterprise can internalise these losses through pricing and insurance, but also by changing its managerial practice, which the individual employee cannot do. Of course, enterprise liability doesn't really exist in English law. It's not a concept we recognise. And vicarious liability very oddly makes a comeback after 1945. Before that point, roughly, there's almost no possibility of an employee suing in vicarious liability that there were one or two exceptions after the 1880 Act and some other ones. But in 1945, Five or so, the legislature abolished workmen's compensation on the grounds of the undue complexity of that body of law and therefore thereby paved the way for vicarious liability to come back. And it also at the same time, in 1948, abolished the defence of common employment. And that's why we see lots of cases on vicarious liability reappearing in the courts in the post-war period that weren't there before. So is this a solution to enterprise liability? No. The big problem with vicarious liability is that it requires the employee to commit a tort. It doesn't work if no tort is committed by the individual worker. So we're not just talking about the employer's personal liability now, the individual employee must commit a tort and the employer is vicariously liable for it. The problem with this, of course, is that they're co-defendants. So the employer can shift the loss straight away back onto the individual worker by joining them to the action as a co-defendant. Basic tort law, the principle of joint liability, is the individual employee who's been at fault. The employer is strictly liable. So the court would, if that happened, put the loss right back onto the employee. Lister and the Romford Ice Company, the House of Lords was invited to say that can't happen because of an implied term in the contract of employment, but declined to do so. Now, Tony Weir, in 1976, wrote a case note on a decision called Morrison and Ford Motor Company. Um, pointing out the real problem here with, with vicarious liability. Tony was an opponent of subrogation. In other words, the right of the insurer, liability insurer, to bring an action in the name of the insured against the, uh, against the defendant employee. Tony opposed subrogation and thought he was wrong. But maybe the real problem with the Morris case is shifting the loss back onto the employee who has no assets to pay. Um, Tony's case note was deemed so dangerous that the CLJ refused to publish it and it eventually appeared only in 2012. But in the meantime, it had been circulated sandwiched that style for many years. Um, the, the CLJ may or may not be more liberal now, who knows, but probably it is. Now, this is what we might call enterprise risk. And the logic of enterprise risk is the enterprise bears um, the liability risk for the reasons we've been discussing. And this is a very old idea, going back to workman's compensation. 1908, 
Um, Court of Appeal decision on the Workmen's Compensation Act. The risk must be instant to the employment. 1999, in Baisley and Curry, the Canadian Supreme Court says vicarious liability arises where the enterprise should absorb the, the risk. And in German law, a very similar thing happens. Remember, in the German Civil Code of the 1890s, there's no provision for vicarious liability to this day. Vicarious liability doesn't really function in German law in the way it does in English law. There can be vicarious liability in contract and responsibility in agency law, but not in tort law. But the courts got round this in the 1950s and 60s by imposing the equivalent to the non-delegable duty of care, the personal duty, which arises where there's a defect in management, a defect in the structure of the enterprise. That was the decision in the 1950s and later on in the 1970s. So therefore, tort law has been evolving in response to changes in the structure of the enterprise. And it evolved in the common law, and it evolved in German law. And unlike the Farwell case in the 19th century, we, we obviously can't assume here that the German development was in any way influenced directly by the common law one. In fact, I'm sure that it absolutely wasn't. So now we come to um, the contemporary situation. In the arms case, where a child placed in care by the local authority is abused by the foster parents, those are intentional torts, batteries, which the foster parents have committed, we do have two ways to deal with this issue. We can either deal with it as a case of vicarious liability. We can say the local authority is vicariously liable for the torts committed by the foster parents. Or we can adapt the notion of a non-delegable duty. We can say that the local authority owes a personal duty to the child to maintain their safety. And this duty is non-delegable in the sense that the local authority continues to be under that duty even after the child has been placed in the care of the foster parents. And of course, this involves an extension of the employment situation because the Wilson's case in the 1930s is essentially saying the limit of the non-delegable duty is a boundary of the enterprise. Only within the enterprise will it work. But now beyond the enterprise, there can be a claim which is not in the enterprise, the child, but also the subcontractor, maybe the independent contractor, the foster parent, is outside the structure of the enterprise. No one suggests they're really employed by the local authority. We're extending the principle to imply a non-delegable duty of care outside the organisational frame of the enterprise. But that may be important. It may be very important in a time of fluid enterprise structures, a so-called gig economy age of Deliveroo and Uber, to be clear that the boundary of the enterprise may be somewhat porous, and there can be vicarious liability beyond the formal structures which firms like Uber put in place to limit their liability. Now, the local authority didn't do that in this case, but the issue arises because they could have cared for the child themselves. The local authority could have taken upon itself the responsibility to care for the child, and of course had a statutory duty to do that if the child wasn't placed with foster parents. So when a child is placed with the foster parents, does the local authority continue to have responsibility? Um, now, because vicarious liability has evolved, um, we can see arms as a case of exactly that, vicarious liability. The, court of a, the, the Supreme Court in the Christian Brothers case, the various claims in Catholic Child Welfare Society case says, you don't have to have an employment contract. Something akin to employment is sufficient to establish the necessary relationship for vicarious liability to work. So a priest who is not employed by the church, the teacher in the Christian Brothers case, they're in a relation akin to employment. And that suffices to make the ultimate employing responsible body, the church or the organisation of the Christian Brothers, responsible for torts committed by the priest or the teacher. The course of employment test is modified. We no longer use the old salmon test. We say, is there a sufficient connection between the job which the employee is doing and the tort they have committed. So an intentional tort, it surely can't be the job of the warden in Lister or the foster parent in arms to injure the child, of course not. But is there a sufficient connection, organisationally, between the job they're given and the tort they commit? If there is, there can be liability for an intentional tort. So the courts have developed vicarious liability so quickly. Now, why have they done that? Of course, at one level, they've done it in response to litigation. Why are these cases being litigated? There's clearly something going on in the system here. Um, these cases have been taken all the way to the Supreme Court several times. Why is this issue being litigated? Discontent about the rule? Clearly the courts are under pressure here to adjust it. That doesn't mean they have to, but we can see there's pressure coming 
on the supply side here for a change. But also non-delegable duty has been extended. It's extended in woodland beyond the original scope. So in woodland, a school subcontracts the care of students involved in swimming lessons. The subcontractor is negligent and the child is injured. Is a school which has insurance, the subcontractor doesn't, liable for the negligence of the subcontractor? Yes, says Woodland and Essex County Council, using the theory of non-delegable duty, not the theory of vicarious liability. So in the arms case, the Supreme Court has basically said vicarious liability and not non-delegable duty is the answer. They say the foster parents were in a situation akin to employment, they're acting sufficiently closely to the job they've been given for this to be within the scope of employment. The local authority's responsibility is vicarious. Right? But in the same decision, the Supreme Court has rejected the idea that there should be a non-delegable duty. Now, that is interesting, and maybe it's questionable. I think that um, the issue here is where to place the concept of the non-delegable duty. And here's a map of the whole of private law. This is maybe partly designed for another lecture as well about pure economic loss. But this is Bishop's point, that private law is structured by reference to the economics of information and insurance. And he argues there's a trade-off going on between the degree of fault involved in a duty and its excludability. He says tort law is really about situations where there are high transaction costs. Parties can't negotiate a contract. The law imposes liability but it uses the fault principle to modulate the content of that liability. So going back to Calabresi, not every accident gives rise to a legal claim, nor does every intentional wrong. So we, we use fault to modulate the liability of the enterprise. But vicarious liability is strict. It's based upon the strict liability of the organisation, even if the person committing the tort is at fault, which they will be, the organisation isn't. Contract is essentially about strict duties which can be modified. So the modifiability of a duty in contract law is a control device, as are remoteness principles, which work differently in contract and tort. The danger for vicarious liability is it's really in the wrong box here. It should move up top left, because there should be a relationship between the degree of fault and excludability of duty. Where a duty is non-excludable, and what could that be but a non-delegable duty? Non-excludable in a very strong sense. Fault liability, not strict liability, would be a better way of dealing with the case. Now, of course, there is fault in vicarious liability. The individual employee is at fault. But my point here is that that fault is personal to them. Whereas with non-delegable duty, the fault we're looking for should be organisational. It should be a fault within the structure of the enterprise or managerial capacity, not something which is really rather contingent at the end of the day, whether the employee is acting in the scope of their employment. So I favour... Um, a move to non-delegable duty, because I think that's the best way to ensure enterprises internalise their costs, but also gives the courts a mechanism they can use to deal with the problem um, that liability could be too extensive here if there's no possibility of a control device coming in like fault to modulate the enterprise's liability. But if we make the enterprise strictly liable, the enterprise will really be ensuring the victim's loss. And that may be a form of liability that's too extreme for defendants to take on, especially public defendants, which are providing public goods, and also really have a zero insolvency risk, because public bodies cannot um, go insolvent. There's a real risk of opportunistic litigation. Not that arms was opportunistic remotely, but there is a risk of opportunistic litigation against public bodies, because they can never be insolvent, whereas private sector firms can ultimately protect themselves by the insolvency route. So my conclusion is that vicarious liability has evolved and it reflects a process which isn't, I think, just a selection of efficient rules. I think it's too, going too far to say rules are always efficient, but they do reflect social pressure. They reflect, in the arms case, a very clear social pressure for a solution to the liability of a very vulnerable group, foster children. So here's a situation where the law has responded to social pressure, but also to changing enterprise and organisational structures. But is vicarious liability the best answer? Probably not. It's a spandrel. It doesn't really work. It has some nice features. It's been around a long time. We may admire it. We may wish to defend it. But there are possibly better emerging alternatives. So my conclusion is that possibly arms reached 
the right result for the wrong reason. I think a non-delegable duty might have been the better solution. But of course, the implication of my lecture is that vicarious liability will not be disappearing anytime soon. Thanks very much.